Hello and welcome to News Click. You're watching Playthings of Alien Forces. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Siddhant Dhani and with me on the show, as always, is our sports editor, Leslie Xavier. Uh, today is an ICC World T20 special. We're talking about all our, all our stories are from that tournament, which is currently underway in the UAE. Uh, India, of course, having a dismal start to the tournament. Two losses out of two. First against arch rivals Pakistan. And then last night against New Zealand, a proper drubbing. Uh, Leslie, you watched the game. Yep. Um, wasn't much to sort of comment on. But what really went wrong? What are the key aspects that India is uh, clearly lacking on? Uh, on uh, the field? I, I guess batting failure has been the I mean, common factor across both the uh, losses. Uh, of course, against Pakistan, you can't say a complete failure as such, but uh, still the back, uh, batsmen failed to make good on the start that they got. And in, against New Zealand, of course, the New Zealand bowlers, they have the uh, ball to play and they won the, won the toss. And then uh, if you look at the wickets that India lost, the early wickets, all of them were in the outfield court, mm -hmm. attacking shots. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, wrong ball. I mean, yeah. It's a tricky call in T20, right? You have to be attacking. So, uh, someone was deceived by a slower ball. Someone was deceived by the uh, bounce. Kohli, again, I mean, uh, going for a six against a spinner. So, it's uh, they went attacking. But I guess when at international level you talk about batsmen applying themselves and with the experience that the Indians have across formats, IPL, they should... I guess I have that understanding which ball to go for, which ball, which bowler. So, for me, if you look at it, there was a, besides short selection or besides the timing of the shot as such, there is also this lack of individual attention given for planning for opponents, which New Zealanders came with, which Pakistan players came with. Yes, because indeed. if you look at a baller's strength, you should know what to expect from that bowler, right? Mm. If it's a change of bounds, change mm. of pace, uh, drift. Mm. Mm. Uh, we just went in, I don't know, was it overconfidence or was it lackluster attitude or was it fatigue also because these guys are playing back to back bio bubbles non-stop in, in the Middle East itself. So, yeah. it could be a factor of all these things, but yeah. With arguably a lot more at stake in other tournaments, but we'll come, we'll come to that little, little further yeah. on in the show. First, I want to ask you, one of the things that I was reading was that India were done in by the size of the boundaries, the, the bigger ground in Dubai. Yeah. Now, for a team that plays this much cricket, is that kind of a reason or reasoning uh, valid from any stretch? Because you, you see then uh, Daryl Mitchell, I think, come yeah. in yeah. and hit sixes whenever he kind of felt like it. We also hit sixes. It's not like uh, our players didn't. And also, it's not sixes that win matches right there are also options to go the ground route you mm. can you can hit boundaries you can make two i mean classic uh, what do you call that cliches of cricket convert two to threes and mm. all those things mm. bigger the ground the larger the chance yeah. for that yeah. and yeah. so uh, again coming to the quality of indian batsmen on paper and what translates to uh, what has translated in the in tournament it's it, there is a, there is a gulf, mm. pun intended, because uh, if you look at Rohit Sharma or Virat Kohli, uh, again Virat Kohli has played just that it didn't work this time around. But first match he did play well. So our KL Rahul, the that brilliant stroke players, uh, use of timing is one of their hallmarks also. So you can you can uh, hit boundaries. Mm. Uh, you don't have to hit sixes all mm. the time. And as far as sizes are matter, Indians have played in all sorts of. Uh, I mean, and Indians never play in uh, smaller grounds that way. It's medium-sized or, or large grounds. Mm. Whereas New Zealand come from a country which has smaller grounds. So, Relatively. if you look at it, that kind of handi uh, handicap applies more to New Zealand than India. So, I, I would disagree with that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, mathematically still, of course, there are chances. Mm. But very difficult now for India to make it through to the next stage, which is the semi-finals of this tournament. Yeah. So, massive sense of disappointment, I guess, for cricket fans in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a disappointment. It's also, uh, I don't know, uh, Indian team is on a cusp also, right? 
because Virat Kohli is last captain, I mean, uh, captain this team as a tournament yeah. uh, T20 skipper. Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know, I mean, as, I mean, I don't exactly qualify as a cricket fan because I am a professional too, so I look at it, things differently. But uh, these kind of things are natural in, in, in a team's transition. Yeah. So, for me, I would take lessons from this. I would, I would look at future, I would look at the next captaincy candidate, the coaching staff changes that is going to happen and mm. I would I would take it forward from here and as, uh, as a, as a uh, uh, person who watches cricket for the joy of it and not ne necessarily fanatic for one specific team, team as such, I would look for positives from this. I would look at young players who are, who are there in the mix, I mean like a spinner like Varun Chakravarti or, or Ishan or uh, Rishabh Pant and all these players and see how the, these players can fit into a larger scheme and, and th take things forward. And I would be hopeful that the next team management would not uh, be insistent on having uh, someone like MS Dhoni as a mentor because that gives out a wrong signal to the current crop of players. It, 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 it's giving wrong signals to Kohli because there is this idea that uh, Dhoni has a brilliant mind. Kohli is aggression personified, but mm. not necessarily. Mm. So that that drills in that s sets a wrong precedent as such. So I hope the BCCI and the management realizes that mistake. Mm. I would call it a mistake, and and give the players in the mix the chance to evolve and become better and be be good at what they do. Right. Hope and BCCI in the same sentence. You are truly an optimist, my friend. Yeah, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> <That's> so, it. <laughs> yeah, it's clearly evident. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Final question. Does India seem to be suffering from a spin problem from the batting point of view? Uh, all of this cricket is being played, mm -hmm. yet uh, Sodi had a great game for New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like our boys didn't understand quite what to do with the spin. It's uh, again because it's I, w I would say it's a cascading effect because uh, you have a bad start then you have you can't be careful with the spinner right and you mm. are when you're facing quality spinners of course it becomes a problem <coughs> excuse me so I would I, I wouldn't call it a problem with spin because Indians traditionally have played in smaller smaller pitches they know how to how to attack take the uh, uh, I, if you look at the batsmen and when they when they were playing they were reading spinners. Okay, it's just that uh, maybe short selection might might have been better, and but again, that's why that's why I said a cascading effect because they had no choice but to go for shots at mm. that point because they had already they were already in the back foot run rate wise, wicket wise. Mm. So how how do you play that? And mm. it's just twenty overs. So mm. uh, so uh, I would still not call it a spin problem as such. I don't think that exists. But yeah. Uh, Indian batting have a problem. Period. Mm. That's that's in yeah. general. Yeah. That's that, that's the thing. Fair enough. All right, we'll wrap up the India bit uh, at that, Leslie. Uh, some kind of headaches for the suits at the International Cricket Council because India going out of a tournament early on is is never a good sign. I mean, you rem we remember that uh, 2003 yeah. uh, 50 over World Cup in the West Indies, West where Indies. not only did that tournament collapse, but sort of as a fallout. I mean, the, the situation, current situation of West Indies cricket yeah. and the kind of economic and other difficulties that they find themselves in can be traced back in a way to that... Uh, uh, it was 2007. 2007, sorry, yeah, sorry, 2007. Yeah. 2007 World Cup and can be traced back to all the yeah. sort of economic fallout that India's early exit from that tournament had. So we'll we'll see if if the, they can figure out some magic formula to make sure. Fall out, I, I don't know because BCCI hosts here and they have. Uh, last I heard, they made some twelve thousand crore. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think there would be too so much. So they're worried pretty happy taking pretty that happy to the bank. That, huh? yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. We're moving on to a slightly uh, more complex story than, of course, India's uh, performance on the pitch uh, at the ICC T20, and we're talking about Afghanistan cricket. Uh, of course, the men's team, the Afghan men's cricket team, doing pretty well at at this ongoing T20 uh, championship. They beat uh, Namibia quite convincingly <laughs> after also uh, registering another win. So, two wins out of three. Uh, reasonably close fight with Pakistan as well. Uh, so, they are doing not too badly still with a chance of qualifying for actually out of a quite tough group. It yeah. also includes India and New Zealand 
for the next round. We're, we'll start with what's happening on the pitch for Afghanistan and then move into some larger aspects of uh, how sport is being looked at under the new Taliban regime in that country. It's a, I'll just get into the India bit of it uh, as far as tournament is concerned. So India started off with the strongest opponents in the group while Afghanistan started off with the easiest opponents. So them getting six points in the kitty, I mean four points in the kitty against two smaller teams, Namibia and Scotland hmm. uh, was, uh, I mean should, should have happened and it's gone by, uh, according to script. They lost against Pakistan though. And now for them, it's the tight matches against New Zealand and India and both of them are in a must-win situation. I mean, all three of them are in a must-win sure. must situation that way. So, uh, India's mathematical chance revolve around New Zealand messing up and then Afghanistan win winning big against Afghanistan. Because as far as Afghanistan's victory against Scotland is concerned, it was by a huge margin. So, their net run rate is plus 3 and for India, it's minus 1.6. So. Mm. Uh, if things fall into place with New Zealand slipping up and a chance o over net run rate with Afghanistan and India have a huge task and, and against the three lesser teams, but mm. still they have to go out and win, win those matches mm. with a big margin. So, And Afghanistan as a team, we should understand that over the course of the last four or five years, they, were, they have gone through stages of development. It's not that they have been... St uh, you you can't call them minos at the T20 level anymore because uh, there are players who are who play in different leagues there are players who feature in IPL as well and there are a couple of spinners are world class their opening batsmen are aggressive they mm. they i mean with the right mold of, uh, of for the T20 game and a uh, couple of great fast bowling talent as well when you look at i mean that side of the world yeah. again that yeah. that Genetic factor, food, water, whatever that is that that works yeah. for Afghanistan as well, and uh, playing together, and they have, they have, they also had a training base in India as well. No? They were based in uh, near, uh, near JP Delhi. Greens in yeah. near New Delhi. So uh, it's all these factors have slowly, uh, and also their experience playing various, te including test play playing countries. It's not like they were playing mm. associate members again. So that has made them a cut above the rest of teams like Scotland and uh, Namibia, whom they were rivals a few years back. Mm. And so that, that takes us to that question where ICC's policy about keeping associates separate and uh, the test playing nations, nations separate and the top three again a separate elite match. It, it hardly helps the uh, global growth of the game as such. Mm. So, uh, only with a team's effort and team's luck and all these factors and also the time factor, it, it just it grows out. And classic example is Bangladesh. Early 2000s, Bangladesh had uh, many number of bilateral series with, with countries like India, England and test playing nations, West Indies. Uh, they just grew from there. And they are a great side now. And the same thing is Afghanistan is getting there now. Mm -hmm. And uh, just that Politically, the country is in turmoil, and things, all the all the growth, all the work that has done in Afghanistan cricket, or for that matter, any sport that way, because Afghanistan football team is also a, yeah. a great side. There, it, 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 there is a chance that things can get undone because of the policies of the of the current regime over there. So that's that's a, a bigger worry. Still, the players are out there performing. With all these things happening back home, they're probably performing with the mission in, to to showcase what they have and what the current regime there should realize hmm. uh, how sport is an engine for them as well. So uh, I, I don't know how things will progress in the because in the in the near future because ICC is yet to come out with 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 the stance on Taliban government and what. Its approach, might, its be. approach might be. Right. Just to, before we get into that any further, just to set the context for our viewers, uh, the situation is such that uh, Afghanistan, of course, scheduled to play a historic one-off test with Australia. Uh, the Australian Cricket Board has threatened to uh, call that off if uh, Afghan's national women's team is not allowed to play cricket. Now, the signals from, from the Taliban government currently in power in Afghanistan are pretty clear that there is not going to be, despite uh, perhaps voices that might have indicated differently earlier, 
uh, they are not well, sport for women is not going to be a thing anytime in the near future. Uh, the few people who are on the ground we were able to contact uh, and speak to have also indicated the same. Uh, women athletes, those that were engaged in any kind of sport earlier, are now uh, staying as far away from it as possible. Even if there is no official ban in place, there is definitely fear that if women are seen engaging in sporting activities or anything that goes against uh, what is being interpreted as the laws of Islam or anything that could be interpreted as un-Islamic will be dealt with very harshly and therefore they are choosing to stay as far away from it as possible. Uh, Afghanistan receives 5 million US dollars in aid from uh, the International Cricket Council annually. This is for the development of sport at the grassroots level and, and other such. Uh, as far as India's role is concerned, uh, uh, in the US-backed uh, regime in Afghanistan, uh, one of our focal areas was the development of a multi-million dollar cricket stadium in Kabul. And cricket was a big part of our diplomacy, as Leslie was mentioning, uh, giving them a base to train here in India. Uh, many of the current players in the men's cricket team, who are also, like Leslie was saying, involved in T20 cricket, uh, they have now found a base in Dubai or other such places away from the country, which allows them to continue their training, uh, their families are relatively safer, and they, they can continue. Uh, however, uh, because of the doubts around women's sport continuing, many nations and international sports bodies are putting pressure on Afghanistan. And as far as we, we can tell, uh, the methodology that they are going to resort to is banning that nation from participating in international events. So, uh, this approach in mind, Leslie, how, how does a ban work and what does it solve, firstly? It solves, I mean, if you are looking at forcing the government to realize what, what, what is wrong, I don't think it, it has ever worked uh, any which way. Yeah, it creates sort of like a precedent, it creates, uh, a, a, and it sets that idea of sanctity of sport and saying sport is equal for for everybody and these are the set of guidelines or these are the set of maxims that sport follows and if, if, if at all someone falters, if human right violations are happening or uh, uh, if, if things are not right in a particular country, there could be a ban. But uh, the larger purpose that it serves, I mean, if sport is making a ban or a move, it should it, it should serve sport in that country or the sports person in that country, right? So, uh, how, how will a uh, blanket ban on Afghanistan serve the current cricketers? Like you said, hardworking cricketers who have put in effort over the years to come up to where they are and they have shifted bases uh, and still plying their trade. And if if they can't represent their country, then it's their loss and uh, and it's not their fault also. So who is getting punished? The players are getting punished. The sport is getting punished. So uh, probably the ICC or for that matter, any global body like the IOC or FIFA, subsequently all these questions will arise yeah. uh, because Afghanistan has a yes. football team. It also has a women's football team who apparently are now in Qatar. I think they, mm. have, they, have, they were uh, airlifted from... Afghanistan and they're based in Qatar now and so uh, a larger discussion should happen within the sporting communities as to how to deal with this this crisis this mm. this situation and uh, ban is more like a caveman approach to it bang 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 it it it, it hardly works anymore mm. we should realize the reality of what global sport has become and what it stands to lose and what it stands to gain if 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 the, if a ulterior approach can be can be arrived at. Especially when we are talking here about the the context or the whole story is based on inclusion, inclusion right? Inclusion, exactly. That that women and perhaps at a few future stage, uh, or even at an early stage, uh, transgender people yeah. be included in in sport, sport and organized sport. And on the other hand, you are excluding uh, mm -hmm. this nation from participating. So, so it's almost at loggerheads with your own logic. Exactly. So uh, that's why Australia. So the first thing that when Australia's news came out, the threat to uh, not stage Afghanistan for the Test match was that wouldn't it serve a larger purpose for Afghanistan sport and the and the democratic voices that need to come out uh, that give these players a platform and let them use that platform and let them also the willing players among the mix and I'm sure many of them 
might have their opinion about what is happening in their country. Uh, imagine that a person scoring a test essentially in a historic test and then post that he, he comes out and he talks about what is happening in their country and what needs to be done. Mm. And that that has a larger, a larger global say to sway things than uh, not playing at all when it would be like, yeah, whose loss is that? So, yeah. and also Australia should also realize that they should probably because that's that's, that's what Indian board should also cricket Australia should also probably think out of the the money idea of it as well yeah, because for them when they do the math it's it's like if you if you ban India then they lose a lot but if you ban Afghanistan they lose nothing that's mm. what their thought is but mm. imagine what they would gain out of it as well yeah. goodwill the the larger role in cricket diplomacy sport diplomacy and also as an entity which set pre precedent for uh, global bodies like the FIFA and I, 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 ICC, I, IOC to take to cognizance take and take over and devise means how to deal with this thing. And Afghanistan is not a one-off also. Across the world, there are places where crisis, global, I mean, uh, interior crisis are happening and there will be instances when uh, such measures have to be mulled. And so let this, I mean, I would urge administrators and uh, diplomats to use this as a stage to set precedent on how to deal with things and world has moved on from 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 the uh, 1940s 50s 60s 70s where yeah. where these things yeah. worked yeah. not anymore particularly from sort of an internationalist multilateral uh, stage you know yeah. like it, it ca cannot be a similar approach to the united states that the united states takes Embargo, embargoes and sanctions on countries uh, that they don't like to yeah, deal exactly. with. Basically. And we, we all know that these embargoes have vested interests and larger things behind. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. trade embargoes yeah. or blanket bans. Yeah. It just, it, it, the it means is to kill a culture, kill a country. Ultimately, the loss is that you lose something. Hmm. So, I mean, and it's a loss felt most by the people. People there. And, uh, and not necessarily the goals that they were set the so-called goals, it nev it's never met. Mm. Of course, a complex situation there in Afghanistan and one yeah. that we'll be looking at uh, closely in the next weeks and months to see how that develops and we'll keep you guys also updated, uh, at least from our understanding, how things are going. Um, and finally, we're talking about another very complex situation and country, uh, South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the actually uh, mixed bag Mm -hmm. of taking a knee approach uh, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement that several teams have taken at this uh, ICC T20. South Africa being among them where apparently it was conveyed to the players that this is a compulsory decision that players must take a knee and, and as a result of that uh, making it mandatory, one of their, I think, key players, Quinton de Kock, who's been a feature of may, uh, several of their sides across formats, chose to withdraw from that team. Uh, <laughs> it's not something that we are talking about in great detail today mm -mm. Uh, because we'll be joined by our friends from South Africa uh, and uh, those that are covering cricket more closely, Sharda Ugra perhaps, to talk about it in detail with Leslie later on. Uh, but just to put the story into a bit of context, Leslie, why did De Kock pull out and subsequently he released a two-page statement that, in my opinion, didn't say much. But how did you read it? Oh, he was trying to state or justify not taking the knee by, I mean, more or less indicating that he was a little confused and also uh, that it he felt that it infringed on his right to decide, which uh, on the outside it's 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 pretty clear. It's a personal choice, also, right? Where you stand as far as Black Lives Movement or the or the or the larger picture of uh, racism. Or as some South African cricketers, former cricketers also have put it, racial inequality that's inherently there in South Africa sport, South African society as well. Yeah. So uh, it's it's openly there have been issues in South Africa as far as running of the sport is concerned. I'm not getting into the society part of it because it's 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 a hugely complex. You call it rainbow nations. I would I would uh, I've been. I've traveled to neighboring states of South Africa, covering cricket, uh, to Zimbabwe. I've met a lot of South Africa former players as well as journalists and 
the la the understanding is that it's it's rainbow but it's also completely fissured as well so it's it's a, it's it's quite a tricky situation there and so uh, former skipper Graham Smith is he heads the cricket operations, the director of cricket op operations in South Africa. And a few months back, for his stance, for the general stance of cricket South Africa, as far as Black Lives Matter movement is concerned, uh, the stance that he took, many former cricketers, including players like Pat Simcox and all that, who has shown inclination that he is a bit racist, and uh, and also. Uh, from various quarters, he received even death threats for his stance supporting the movement. So that's the kind of social, societal pressure that is there on players, on white players, uh, and on black players and, uh, as well. And the pressure on black players is manifold. And it's uh, even Michael Holding has, has uh, dedicated a chapter in his book, book, book towards this quoting Makai Antini, who is one of their greatest black players, first black player to play for South Africa internationally. And uh, it's the quota system, which was supposed to help integrate black players into the into mainstream cricket and international cricket. But it's, it's it, the, the backfiring that is happening is that we, uh, the players who make it, mm. they are under tremendous pressure throughout their careers, so much so that their achievements are also marginalized or undermined with the quota tag. Mm. And Dini has openly said that. Mm. So he's one of the greatest bowlers of the generation and he, he, he always felt that he was never there. He, he always felt that he was not recognized. Mm. So, and that kind of baggage that a player, a black player has to carry, it, it, it trickles down into the grassroots where mm young kids, young black kids are not willing to take up cricket at mm. all. And that's that again, Antini has come out uh, earlier in the year mm. on record saying how uh, the province that he comes from and also various states where black players used to come up, it's, 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 it's dwindling now. Mm. Nobody is taking up the sport and so it's not about, so what he was trying to say was that the quota system is firstly creating problems and secondly, it's not coming down to a to a planned systematic approach where domestically there is a uh, system in place where black players are, can be included right. and brought up. That's right. not there. It's always, I mean, uh, the root always is for white players. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, Brexit has created problems where all the white players used to leave South Africa. They are all going to come back. It's going to be a big mess now. South Africa cricket with the corruption allegations in the previous administration, with the current headaches that uh, that uh, the current crop have to deal with, including what Quinton de, de Kock has. Because it's not, I mean, if you look at de Kock's move, it's not a, I mean, it can, it is interpreted as a personal decision. From his letter, it's, 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 they have tried to portray it as that, but it showcases a larger problem in that team, in that setup, in the country. and. Uh, and it's it's something that ICC has to deal with also because it shows that ICC's approval for the teams. It's not ICC's de decision apparently. ICC spokesman on record has come and said that it's the team's decision to do this. We have nothing to say in that. We have just given them permission mm. because ICC's rule states that uh, any sort of political, social, religious messaging or insignia or signage on on, t on jerseys and all that are banned, are not allowed, will be allowed provided prior permission is taken. So mm. uh, again, in that statement, they never mentioned that they have given a blanket permission for Black Lives Movement uh, taking the knee, sim symbolic gesture of taking the knee. But it's clear that they have. They have. Mm. And, uh, Again, interestingly, India also joined the bandwagon, but second match they didn't take the knee as well. And it's it's a, it's a kind of like a zombie situation where uh, brainwash situation, I would say, where players didn't have any say. I believe mm. if you believe what Kohli was saying, mm. saying we were asked to do it, we're doing it, mm. and we were asked to not do it, we are not doing it. Mm. So where do we stand mm. <laughs> as far as responsibility is concerned? So in that regard, maybe Quinton de Kock is better because he at least took a stance on something he believes. 
Yeah, it's, it's one, right. One way or right or wrong. Right. So I look forward to uh, your uh, in-depth chat on the situation in South Africa because I mean, many of us can. I mean, in our country, we can relate to the challenges that yeah. any policy decision that includes affirmative action, uh, all of the the obstacles, the barriers, the opposition that these kind of moves face, and how it oftentimes lead to further marginalization of the sections that that are. Uh, not further marginalization, but in, in this kind of, in the narrative at least that's created in against these kind of quota systems. Uh, so I'm, I look forward to that well, larger yeah. chat and I think uh, many of our viewers will as well. But that'll uh, do it for our show. We said we'll do about 25 minutes and we've done a little bit over that as usual. Uh, but uh, we'll keep it under 30. So, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's wrap it up here thank you very much uh, for watching you this has been uh, playthings of alien forces uh, from leslie and me uh, that will do it for us today you can follow us on newsclick.in for all our sports stories as well as see updates on all our social media channels we'll be back next week with more and stay tuned for all the updates on the other stuff we do around sport goodbye